Reflection question number four. As you read through the Sermon on the Mount and think about Jesus' teachings in general, are there commands of Jesus that you tend to ignore or portions of his teachings that you find it convenient to overlook? Maybe you find a way to excuse yourself from having to obey him or find a way to understand them that relieves you of having to actually do what he says. Of course, we need to understand his sayings in, his, in context and not misunderstand, for instance, his hyperbole as if it were meant to be taken literally. But are, the, are there areas of his teaching that you find difficult to follow? What are they and how do you handle that? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount unveils the very heart of kingdom living. He lists many assured blessings to the most unblessed maxims within their first century context. The Beatitudes juxtaposed against the virtuous life in the Greco-Roman world were radically countercultural. The poor, the mourning, the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted were envisioned as a way of being truly human according to Jesus' pattern. This view was thoroughly paradoxical because the virtuous life in the first century were for the imperial elites and kings engaged in the world's pursuit for power and strength. For Christians, this kingdom vision should compel us to remain faithfully present in the public sphere as peacemakers of another world. Peacemaking is a difficult ministry of reconciliation, especially the peacemaking prescribed in the Sermon on the Mount. As a self-confessing evangelical Christian, it is easy to ignore genuine peacemaking because of a conversion-driven conscious. Evangelicalism has historically been driven by a dynamic decision-making and soul-saving fervor, and this has unfortunately affected the psyche of many Americans. I am included among this company of people, and I am one who is seeking to recover genuine peacemaking as a Christ-inspired action for the common good. In a post-industrial world permeated by war, violence, and systemic injustice, the church is called to embody peacemaking as an alternative form of being human. Of course, as Christians, it is difficult to do this faithfully and steadfastly over a long period of time. Peacemaking takes patience and long-suffering. And as Christians contending for peace in a world driven by conflict, it is convenient to overlook. Why should the Christian be preoccupied with the welfare of the socially marginalized and destitute? Why should we care about globalization and the ramifications of economic policies? I thought that was the government's job. This is the common evangelical mantra here, and it is unfortunate we have spiritualized the faith to become solely a private affair. I find myself wanting to simply attend church, invite friends to a conference, and hope this is enough to check off my spiritual duties. This is a dangerous train of thought I do not want to follow through. I want to, vol I want to value humans as the Imago Dei and strive to implement kingdom life for the common good. Ultimately, if the church does not step in, who will? Com competing kingdom visionaries will step in and establish their communes, their propaganda, their vision of what it means to be truly human. Peacemaking... Peacemaking can be practical, but on a larger scale, we must rid ourselves of the harsh delineation between nature and grace, heaven and earth, spiritual and material. Because God is in Christ restoring all things and sustains the world by the word of his power, let us participate in the divine life and bring about peace through patient faithfulness and long-suffering like our Lord.